Professor Nuremberg, what, what kind of family were you born into? Uh, I don't quite know how to answer that. My parents were immigrants. They came from Ukraine. Okay. And uh, my father was a Hebrew teacher. And uh, uh, I was born in Hamilton, Ontario. Right. And, uh, and then at some point when I was six years old, family moved to St. Catharines, Ontario, where my father was the principal of the Hebrew school. But it was during Depression, and the people there found they couldn't afford, afford it. And then my parents had to leave, and they moved to Montreal. They couldn't afford to send their children to Hebrew school. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't afford to keep up the Hebrew school. Wow. So, so they sent my so my family moved to Montreal when I was eight. Was your mother a traditional uh, housewife at home? Did she, she have her own intellectual interests? Uh, she loved to read, but she had no no profession. And uh, she was very kind and she was a very warm person. I was I must say I was very. She was a wonderful mother. Were you the only child? No, I had two sisters. My older sister died when she was 22. Mm -hmm. She developed cancer mm -hmm. and she died. And then I have a younger sister who's six years younger. She lives in Greece. Oh. And so, she comes here every year for a couple of months, stays with me. I'm assuming a traditional family, you can correct me. But I'm assuming the family was not religious. Even was already, not religious. even already in Ukraine, they were not religious. Ah. Their parents were religious, but they were not religious. So the Hebrew teaching was an, an intellectual pursuit. Isn't yes, it? that's right. He was a teacher already in Ukraine. He taught uh, Hebrew and Yiddish, and uh, and so he continued doing that. And then, as the depression continued, when they returned to Montreal. My father had a hard time getting a job, so the, the schools were full, and so he made a living essentially uh, preparing children for bar mitzvah, oh. and that got harder and harder financially. And finally, my mother said we should open some kind of shop, and so they opened a small gift shop where they sold english china crystal oh. things like that and it is essentially my mother who ran it oh. well this is again often known the woman works hard at the craft and the, and the man pursues uh the intellectual pursuits yeah tell me what their ambitions were for you because i'm sure they had ambitions for you uh well my mother certainly had ambition for me and uh I must say, I went to uh, the schooling in Montreal was very good, especially the high school. I went to a terrific high school. It was during Depression. And to be a high school teacher was a good job. So there were excellent teachers. In fact, I have fonder memories of that high school than I do of the university that I went to afterwards, although the university was very pleasant. But the high school was particularly good. Lots of bright students. How do I get you to be a scientist who wants in high school to study with a good science teacher? Are you uh, born interested in science? Or is I, your family encouraging of it? Uh, my family was not particularly encouraging, but uh, in the high school, the, the things I liked best were geometry. That was my favorite subject. And the physics teacher actually had a PhD. Imagine this, in a high school. And, he, and they were all very good teachers. And so I decided I would like to study physics based on my, I didn't, I had no idea that mathematics was a living subject. You are, you are one of the few people I've interviewed uh, among the, the laureates who did not seem to have had at home some scientific push or some uncle who was an engineer who said do this or, so for you, was it a self-discovery? Uh, yeah, I think it was. It was really a self-discovery. There was no scientific push. Hmm. Any uh, early mentor before, even before high school? Uh, I don't remember no. anything in particular. No. 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 Okay. So um, there you are in high school. You have the good fortune to have a good teacher with good good teachers. It good teachers with good background. Okay, yeah. And um, they certainly have ambitions for you. I mean, you must have been a good student. Yes, I was a good student. And, uh, 
and it was really a pleasure. And that high school, the high school closed some years ago, and I was told that uh, a few years ago some Montreal newspaper published some article about some of the people who had later become famous who were graduates of that high school. Of course, I was not mentioned in that article. No. <laughs> <laughs> It was mostly singers and actors, probably? No, there were people in science. In science, yeah. really. Uh, yeah. I know that from talking with some of your colleagues that in Budapest there was that kind of a gymnasium also that an amazing number of people came out of. So you were lucky yes. anyway. Yes, yes, I, I, was, I feel I was very lucky, yeah. As it's still the depression. And the students were very good. The students. fellow students were very, very bright. And one learns from one's yeah. fellow oh, yeah. students I, I, as much I, I, as absolutely. anyone. Absolutely, yeah. How do you begin to craft a, a, a career goal? Um, you're, you're good, you've decided on theoretical physics. That's right, In part because of physics. this teacher. Yeah. Um, what do you do next? How do you decide when to go, where to go? Well, I applied, I, living in Montreal, I applied to McGill University. I applied for a scholarship and did not get it. And uh, my parents said they had a, have a hard time sending me there. And, however, the, the high school offered an additional year, which was equivalent to a first year of college. So I stayed in the high school another year, hmm. and that was 12th year at the time. And then I applied again for a scholarship, and this time I got it. And so I entered McGill, and I was in McGill only three years instead of four years. Having had this advanced Having had this, work. this year. Yeah. Um, important stage in an undergraduate's life is choosing a specialty. So you had predetermined that you wanted to be in theoretical physics. You stayed with that uh, major? That's right. So I majored actually in mathematics and physics. It was called oh. Honors Mathematics Physics. Because and the choice of a career in mathematics or physics often comes up, mathematicians I speak no, to... No, it wasn't that. I didn't think of a career in mathematics. You never did? No. Uh, at that time, I, I didn't think at all. I thought I, I would go on to physics. Because I really didn't know that mathematics was a live, vibrant subject. Uh, in fact, at the college, there was only one mathematician who did research. His name was Gordon Paul. He was very encouraging, very nice person, very encouraging. I think there was nobody in physics who did research at at McGill University at that time. Huh. So it was but, it was a clear course in your mind. Yeah, a clear course. I wanted to do physics. What yeah. what set you wrong? Yeah. <laughs> How did you? Pure pure luck. Oh well, luck often plays a role. Tell yeah. me about it. So I in the summer I graduated in the spring of forty five when the war in Europe just ended. And I got a job at the National Research Council in Montreal. They were doing atomic research. And the son, a son, not the son, but a son of Richard Courant, yes, the, was the working, legendary man. who was a physicist, yes. was working there. And he had married a girl from Montreal, who I knew, ah. who was also working there. And once she said, you know, we're going for a weekend to New York to visit Courant, and I had I read some of his book, Courant Hilbert, Methods of Mathematical Physics, very famous book. And I said to her, could you ask him where I might apply to study physics? Because at McGill, nobody had suggested that I apply to graduate work, where I might apply, and somehow it didn't happen. And she came back and, and said, Courant suggests, why don't you come and get a master's, perhaps, in mathematics? at New York University, and then you might go on and study physics. I'm not going to let you go to New York yet until you answer the question, how come you were not drafted? You were oh, in high school during the war. Science students were not drafted at that time. In Canada, In certainly. Canada, yeah. Ah. So, uh, so I, w I was not drafted. So you were able yeah. to sustain. I was able to stay in college, yeah. Okay, now I get, yeah. I'll let you go to New York. So, so I, I went for an interview in the summer, right? And I met Courant and famous mathematician Friedrich, who had been a student of Courant in Göttingen, Germany, and he came to America in the thirties, a little after Courant, and they offered me an assistantship, a graduate assistantship, and so in the fall I came to New York University, and never left. I just stayed with mathematics. So you are a, a poor lover of physics to have abandoned it so quickly. 
That's right, and I, I have an enormous admiration for physicists, <laughs> I should say. What was attracting you in mathematics? Why, why were you beginning to be comfortable with that as a career? Well, I, of course, I always liked mathematics. And then uh, I was inspired by Friedrichs, this former student of Courant. He was a wonderful mathematician. And uh, he was, I would say, in fact, he was the person who influenced me most in mathematics. Is it yeah. wrong to think of a European tradition of mathematics as opposed to an American one? Because here he had come from Europe, certainly from Germany, which may have been a very important yeah. center. No, no, I think it's right to think that there was a certain tradition in Göttingen in particular, where Courant had been the director of the Mathematics Institute oh. until the Nazis threw him out. And uh, there was a, a certain tradition of mathematics, in particular, a field called mathematical analysis. He had written a very famous book with a very famous German mathematician named Hilbert in that subject, in sort of called methods of mathematical physics. And uh, so he, the students he trained were also in that subject. And that was the main theme, I would say, at, at New York University, the, the graduate mathematics study was mainly in in uh, mathematical analysis and applied mathematics and applied mathematics and applied because, mathematics because yeah. there's a a conventional clearly incorrect notion that there's a choice of either doing mathematical analysis or applied mathematics but it's right. not important and Kuran never believed in that distinction ah. he always believed there were just if there's just mathematics and you know you do it, and you do it if you happen to do some applied problem. Okay, in fact, Peter Lax is a perfect example of some somebody who did wonderful things in both, both pure and applied. Yes, he dismissed the idea that there was a difference. That's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, um, and we got that from Courant, really. Is um, is Friedrichsen going to be your supervisor? Well, I when it came to choosing a supervisor, I went to Friedrichs. And he suggested a subject, and I thought about the subject for a few months and didn't get anywhere. And I told him that I wasn't getting anywhere with the subject. And then I, one of his colleagues, Jim Stoker, su suggested a problem in geometry to me. And so I began to work on that problem. And that involved, to solve it involved working with non-linear partial differential equations. And that's how I really got into that subject, which has been my subject of my whole career. Mm. And so my thesis advisor was Jim Stoker, not Friedrichs. But I spoke, while I was working on the thesis, I spoke more to Friedrichs than I did with Stoker. And Friedrichs was a real inspiration. And as I say, I consider, always considered him my mentor, my sensei. Yes, your sensei. Yeah. Exactly, I understand. Can you give me some sense of graduate life uh, this time? I mean, are is mathematics pursued in intense isolation in graduate work, or is there a, a social interaction that is also intellectual? There was a lot of social interaction. The, this, the uh, number of graduate students was small. It was just after the war. But there were some terrific people, uh, Joe Keller, Harold Grad, and then Peter Lax came a year after I had, I was there, he came out of the army, and uh, he came as an undergraduate in your university, though he took graduate mathematics courses. Uh, uh. And in fact, he always knew more mathematics than I did. That's always my feeling it, it, throughout our whole career that he always knew more than I did. Okay, yeah. uh, I would love to know as a layman what it means to know more mathematics. Do you mean that he read more widely among he, he, in the literature? He was more familiar with things in mathematics than I was. May, I, don't, I don't know if he read more widely, perhaps he did. You know, reading mathematics is hard. And uh, many mathematicians don't read so much mathematics that they find it's really hard. And uh, the, one of the because things of the that, density of the, yeah, yeah, of the inquiry, yeah, yeah, it's just hard to read. It's technical. It's hard to read, 
And many mathematicians are poor writers, I have to say. They don't make an effort to make things very clear, unfortunately. One of the things often said in celebration of your career is that you were and are lucid. Um, well, I try to be lucid, that's true, yes. I do and this try. was uh, from the beginning. I mean, you, as a graduate student, you, you found it easier to articulate the issues? Well, the graduate students also taught, you know, and so I taught already as a graduate student, and, uh, well, I tried to be clear. I mean, and as I say, the, the body of graduate students, is, though small, was very good. Kathleen Moore was joined a year after I was there, and as well as Peter Lax. And uh, there was a lot of interaction. Uh, yeah. Martin Kruskal, and we not only became friends, but we often talked mathematics, talked about what we were trying, what we were doing, and so on, yeah. One little question, really, about is about a career in mathematics. Is there now money pouring in to give one hope of a, an academic position? Is the institute itself flourishing in terms of support? Uh, I'm not so up to date with how well the institute is, is doing. But I, at that time, when you but, were... Oh, at that time, uh, there, there was very little support, and uh, I never thought I would make much of a living as a mathematician. And so what happened to me that I not only made, made a living, not a great living, but I made a yeah. living, and traveled a lot, going to meetings a lot. So that was completely unexpected. Going to me, that was a kind of miracle that, that, that developed. Was it perhaps the war itself that began to have more money pour into, this is a guess on it, my part, it's not that I know, uh, uh, into mathematics partly and the war, theoretical... Partly Sputnik. After Sputnik, uh, uh, American, the government decided to put more money into science to help develop science. So Sputnik was a big help. And of course about the war, you know, people often say that Hitler created American science. And so many good scientists came to America. Mm. I'm going to ask a question about age and mathematics uh, because it's one of those professions, disciplines, that famously one can achieve a lot early. Um, was this true in your career? Were you, be, were you having great insights early? Uh. I don't know. Well, just I, I in don't, the life I of don't your believe career. in the cliche that mathematicians do their best work before they're 30. Okay. I don't believe in that. Okay. That's, that's a good answer to my question. Um, it emerges at least that you can have great ideas in your younger years. Yes. Historians sure. like me don't have great ideas for a while. But, um, but it's not inevitable, I think, is what you're saying. That's right. It's not inevitable. Also, when I was a graduate student, I read a book by Hardy famous English mathematician, and uh, that book discouraged me because in the book at some point he says a good mathematician always thinks of his or her own problems. And when I was a graduate student, I couldn't think of my own problems. It took me years until, several years until I could really come up with my own problems. And I t always tell this to, to present graduate students, they shouldn't be discouraged. So you get your problems from your professor, is yes, that it? Yes, that's right. The professor suggests a problem, you get that, and, of, and eventually you start thinking of your own problems. As you mature, as you learn more, you come up with your own problems. So you're arguing maturity actually is pretty important in a mathematical career. It's not all y yes, yes, it, it being is a important. prodigy. That's right, sure, sure, you learn and you, yeah, of course. What is it that, once assigned, draws one to a problem? And is it a problem, is it a question that mostly excites the mind? Or is it a, is it a proof that you're searching for? What is it that um, draws you? Uh, it's really curiosity. And sometimes you don't care if it, if, 
what you're working on turns it to, out to be true or false. It's just you want to settle it. Oh. You know, you're curious. Here is this question. And for instance, I'm, I've been stuck on a problem now for years. And I don't particularly care if it turns out one way or the other, but I would like to know. And so I work on it. And just uh, curiosity plays an enormous role, but it does in every in every scientific subject, I'm sure that's not unique to mathematics. And one thing about mathematics is, you know, you solve a problem and you think, okay, that's settled. Problems lead to new problems. They always lead to new questions. That's one of the beauties of the subject. That they're always, whatever you do, it leads to something new. You, it leads to asking new questions. And that's the excitement. That the yeah, that's it's very exciting. And then to work on it, and most of the time you're stuck. I mean, ninety percent of the time you're just stuck. And that doesn't lead to despair. Well, no. I mean, you're used. You got one gets used to it. Okay, I'm stuck. And sometimes one works. You work on several problems at the same time, not necessarily just one problem. And that I think is very good. Also, I encourage young people to collaborate. Almost all my problem, all my work is joint work with others. Which is unusual. T today it's, le it's more usual. It's become more and more standard. But not in the day? Not, not, not at you're... that time. No, when I was a student, no, it wasn't, that wasn't common. I do notice words like taste and elegance being used to describe mathematical inquiry. And these are words normally I associate with the arts, but can you give me some feeling for, I know there's, it, for taste as an it's, idea. It's very hard to explain, but there is certainly taste in mathematics, and some mathematicians have very good taste. Right? At one point, uh, at some birthday celebration, or maybe it was a prize celebration for Peter Lax, people were talking about his work, and I spoke about his work, and I said that he has wonderful taste in mathematics. And I also said, it's, it's hard to explain what taste is, but you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, yes, like pornography. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to those of us who can't comprehend any serious mathematical research, it seems as though you're all geniuses, uh, because you can go where we cannot go. Um, but within the field, what is greatness? How do you, how do you characterize so, uh, it? Original mm -hmm. ideas. For instance, um, the other day I was talking with my daughter, we were talking about mathematics, and uh, she was saying, we were talking about Nash in particular, oh, yes. and uh, she was saying, uh, I was saying how much I admire, admired his work, and she said, did you ever feel that when you heard about some of his results, Gee, I wish I had thought of that? And I said, no, what my reaction was, I would never have thought of that. That was my impression of Nash. Oh. He had ideas that I would never have thought of. So does that Just constitute... extremely original ideas. And that constitutes genius? Maybe that's a yeah, boring yes, it, word I for think you? No? His, I, I really thought he was a genius. When did you get to know him? Oh, we were young at the time, around 55 or 56. He had uh, just written, he had written a paper on, in geometry very famous paper, which I, that's a paper where I thought I would never have thought of that, really remarkable. And he spent a year, he was on leave from MIT, he spent a year in, in Princeton, but he spent a lot of it actually in New York. And he came to, to uh, New York University often, and we talked often, and also socialized. He would come to dinner, and we would saw a lot of each other that year. Mm -hmm. But then after he had his breakdown, we didn't see so much of each other. Right, I understand. Oh, was he at that point before the breakdown pretty sociable? Oh yeah, yeah, very sociable. Very sociable. Let's talk about space and mathematics. I mean, nothing more than the fact that your life in particular, but maybe many mathematicians, had a life in the world community of mathematics. It seems to me a very integrated world. Is that well, fair I to think say? of it as a family. As a, in fact, a wonderful family. You know, I travel, I go to somewhere, and immediately the colleagues there, I just feel perfectly at home with them. Now, 
there are normally problems of language in encounter across cultures, uh, politics, uh, for example, during the Cold War, and so forth. Was this irrelevant to the family of mathematics? Well, uh, talking about Cold War, and mm -hmm. I first went to the Soviet Union in, at a joint Soviet-American conference in my field, partial differential equations. It was organized by Courant and a professor in the Soviet Union, a very distinguished mathematician. And it took place in Novosibirsk in Siberia, and what's called it. They had an academic city they had constructed there with university and so on. There were about two dozen Americans and about 120 Soviet mathematicians. And it was like being on board a ship for two weeks. You made friends immediately. And with some of them, we talked politics all the time. Really? Yeah. Some of them were just so violently against the government, the communist government, mm -hmm. and discussed the difficulties and, and uh, anti-Stalin. Of course, Stalin was dead at that time. Yes. Was 63, there was Khrushchev. So it was a period of thaw, and people there were very encouraged, thinking things will improve right. with the West, the relations with the West, things will get softer in the Soviet Union. But then Khrushchev was kicked out, and Brezhnev came to power, right. and, it was and back uh, to ended back to that time. On a very human level, um, I've discovered, I think, your first significant stay abroad was uh, at Göttingen in, in the early 50s, uh, roughly then. Well, I went, for, I went for a year. I had a year. I had a National Research Council scholarship, and I spent most of the year in Zurich, actually. But I... I, I, I spent do, one month in Göttingen. I, I, again, maybe incorrectly, have the impression that you felt uncomfortable being in Germany. That's true. And, this, my, and my wife, too. We were supposed to stay longer, and we decided after a month to go back to Zurich. Uh, for for the because of the because of the, the what had happened in Germany, had, happened. Yeah. had you chosen Göttingen uh, as a place to go because of Friedrich? I, no, Courant had suggested it. Uh -huh. Courant urged me to go to Göttingen. After the war, Courant made many trips to Germany. He wanted to help develop again mathematics in Germany, and he had many contacts still. And I think he was very influential. When you returned, you returned to a job you already had. Yes, that's right. I returned to, to NYU as an instructor. Right. Any, um, you stayed at NYU really your whole career. The whole career, yeah. No I, temptation to... Um... Well, I had some offers, but I, I was treated very well at NYU. I was very happy at the Koran Institute, and I loved New York. I fell in love with New York when I came here. And I've been in love with it all these years. We've spoken of Nash and uh, your meeting in New York at a certain point, then of course his illness, separation. You had a quite significant reunion uh, when you both won the Abel Prize the yes. same year. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And really, why were you both called to the prize at the same time? Oh, they d just... I can't, well, I think they decided to give the prize in a subject, geometric analysis. And of course, Nash was an obvious person for that prize. And I guess the whoever was on the committee decided, well, there are other people too. And I guess they, they probably had a list of names. And then they, they decided to give a joint prize. Was that your first reunion since oh, New no. York? No, I saw, well, when he was ill, I would sometimes visit Princeton. And I would run into him, and we would chat. He, at that time, I think he he often had lunch at the Institute for Advanced Study, and whenever I was there and saw him at lunch, I would go over to him, and we would have lunch together. So Oslo was a happy reunion. After yes, and then last the fall before Oslo, the the French embassy arranged a meeting between a conversation between him and a French mathematician named Cedric Villani, who is often on television, very good representative for mathematics and a very bright mathematician. And they had a conversation at a uh, cultural center of the 
friend on the east side and people were invited so I went and I saw Nash and his wife there and we chatted a while mm. and uh, that was the time the one time I the last time I saw him before going to Oslo right right and then sadly there was not the opportunity after that but no, yeah. we flew back together he and his wife and I oh. they had changed our flight and so there was nobody to meet him or to meet me. His that limo. was why. Yeah, and that's, that was why. Yeah. And so we waited and finally I managed to contact my daughter who came and picked me up. We chatted for an hour at the airport. Mm -hmm. And then they just, when my daughter came, they said, well, they'll take a taxi. And then the horrible tragedy. You had I assume the pleasure of going to Heidelberg, uh, the Laureate's Forum. Of course, it was a, a great pleasure. For a sociable pleasure. fellow, it must have been interesting. But can you tell me something about the experience? Yes, it was the most interesting part was meeting the young people who came from all over the world. And here are these bright, enthusiastic young people, and they come to you and they ask questions. I didn't give a talk, but some of the, many of the people, many of the touring people and other winners did give talks. I didn't, but, but just the interaction with the young people was, was the, the best thing about it.